Welcome, LA Progressive friends and family and readers and subscribers. Uh, this is Sharon Kyle with you again. And today I am with Fanula Ni Aloy. And Fanula has a fascinating background. I'm going to let her introduce herself, but I will just say a little bit. Fanula was the former UN Special Rapporteur on um, United Nations Human Rights Council. Okay, so I'm going to let her give you a little bit more um, of a background on that. She's a law professor and she's currently at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Fanula, thank you for joining us and welcome. Thank you. I am super glad to be here. And it was a pleasure to meet. We were both at the premiere of um, I am, I am Gitmo. And I think um, it's a powerful film. And um, I think obviously represents um, an important contribution to the broader debate about um, the history and the legacy of torture and rendition by the U.S. Oh, government of Guantanamo. Absolutely, absolutely. So let me just uh, jump in right here and just give a little bit about I Am Gitmo. So I Am Gitmo is a film um, that is currently in theaters, I believe. Uh, uh, Fanula and I met at a screening of I Am Gitmo in uh, Santa Monica, California, about 10 days ago or so. And it is uh, pro produced and directed um, by Felipe um, Diaz and um, Beth Portello of Cinema Libre. Cinema Libre does a wonderful job of distributing lots of documentaries um, that are social justice oriented. And this one in particular, they poured themselves into. I Am Gitmo is a fictional account based completely on actual events. And um, it, it tells the story of a school teacher who was, um, I guess the term is renditioned and then taken into Guantanamo after, shortly after 9-11. Um, so if you have an opportunity, I encourage everyone to go see I Am Gitmo. And Fanula was a speak after the film, there was a speaker, a, few speakers, and Fanula was one of them. So um, Fanula, tell us about your background in um, studying human rights and um, being an advocate for human rights. Why don't you uh, just go on and I'm gonna not going to interrupt you. Well, I started my um, human rights career in Belfast, Northern Ireland. I'm from mm. Ireland. I went to law school in Belfast in the 1980s. We were still in the height of a conflict, and I suppose I was drawn to Belfast because of the fact that there was a conflict, but also because we had this really challenging legacy of human rights violations. Um, and so my path really, I, I think I said at the opening, my path has been sort of from Belfast uh, via Guantanamo and some other places. But I think most of my work uh, for many years was based in Northern Ireland around the conflict. But as I suppose I developed an expertise in issues related to violence, uh, conflict, counterterrorism, I had the opportunity to do some other things. I worked during the conflict in Bosnia in at the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I was able to spend several years working in the Middle East based in Jerusalem. And I finally in 2017, partly because of this policy and, and, and academic role that I played, I was able to go to Guantanamo, go as a result of this UN role to Guantanamo and carry out the first official UN visit to the detention facility. So a kind of a long and circuitous route, but um, one that I suppose is embedded in the history of human rights abuses in multiple places. So for those of you who haven't really been following what's been going on in Guantanamo, it might shock you to know that the Guantanamo um, naval base in Cuba is still holding prisoners. Is that right? Um, it is true. I mean, I think one of the things is that, of course, we have this image of Guantanamo as a place associated with the immediate aftermath of 9-11. And there's sort of a lot of us have that imagination, those orange jumpsuits, the images that came out in early in the early 2000s. But actually, a lot of people don't even know that the detention facility is continuing. Um, it, it has currently 30 uh, men who are detained um, uh, detained arbitrarily for uh, 16 of them. 
they've never, well, 19, in fact, 16 of them have been cleared for released, but not yet released, never charged with any offense, no evidence that they have taken acts or violence against the United States, told that they are free to go, but in fact, there's nowhere to send them to. And three men who've been held for their entire period, the most famous of whom is a, an individual called Abu Zubaydah, who's never been charged with a crime. So it's sort of impossible, I think, for many Americans to imagine that the US continues to hold people for almost two decades and never charge them with a crime. I mean, it's it's Kafkaesque, you know, that, that idea that like at the heart of a democracy is sort of the idea of due process. If you're gonna be, if you're gonna be deprived of your liberty, you are gonna have some kind of legal process that justifies depriving you of your liberty. And so, so yeah, I, I think it's shocking to many Americans to know that it, that prison still exists. And it's also frankly, the most expensive prison on earth. The cost of keeping that prison open dwarfs any other prison costs, either in the US or anywhere else in the world. This is, um, yeah, you, you're right. It's, it's so, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, a few years ago, Jodie Foster made a movie, uh, and it was a, a popular movie called um, Murit, The Mauritanian. And um, there was actually, and, and that movie was loosely uh, based on the experience of a person who was at Guantanamo, who was from Mauritania, and his name is Muhammad Amadou Al Slahi. And and uh, we had a, we at the LA Progressive we had an opportunity to interview him. I'd heard he had a um, a story on This American Life, and the story. If anyone has a chance, you can just do a Google search for This American Life, and the name of the episode is it's episode number seven fifty two, and it's called An Invitation to Tea, and um, Muhammadu Al Al Slahi had been released, has been released, and since his release has done quite well. He's written a book and um, he's living a, a prosperous life and he's married. And he, after um, a lot of healing, he wanted to reach back and touch base with people who had treated him so badly in Guantanamo. And that's what this American Life episode is all about. So I'm not gonna say any more about that. I'm just gonna encourage people to go and, and listen to it. Um, the Mauritanian, Jodie Foster's movie, um, could have been an opportunity to explain to Americans what our country is continuing to do, but I did not get that from that movie. I don't know if you've seen it. I have, and I, I mean, I, I think obviously Mahamadou's book, and I recommend to your readers, there's some extraordinary books out there from former detainees who are articulate and thoughtful and expressive and and write so well about their experiences. Mohamedou's book, um, I think, is a really important book. And the film, I think, captures something of this, both the relationship, um, the experience of detention. Um, it also captures, I think, the role that his lawyer played in ensuring his release. But one of the things that I think this film that we both saw last week, I Am Gitmo, does that's different, is this, this book is, this film is a really hard film to watch. It's an unflinching film. It's a film that doesn't soft coat or soft mist torture. I think what you're exposed to in this film is really the experience of harm from the point of view of the, the detainee, right? And it doesn't sugarcoat the scale and specificity of the violence. And one of the reasons I think that's really important is because as our memories fade of orange jumpsuits and the information we've had about the torture program, I think a lot of us have lost sight of what it actually did to the physical bodies and minds of the people who experienced it. And I think the power of this film by Felipe Diaz and by Cinema Libre is that there's really no space to kind of avoid the kind of granularity of torture and the harm that it does to the individual. And but what's also what's redeeming about that film, because I want people to go see it and say I, I, people will say, oh, that's too hard. I can't go see it. I think what's so powerful about this film is it's the humanity of the film and the redemption of people in the film. 
it shows the lives, the inner life of the people who were tortured. But it also, I think, demonstrates that those who were engaged in torture, the people who facilitated the torture, the interrogators, are not monochromatic. And it kind of forces us to interrogate the kind of American nationalism, the kind of national security thinking that blinded people to the horror of what they were inflicting on other human beings. So it's a deeply moral film and you're gonna come out of it feeling good, not because of course it's telling a story that is easy, but because there's an enormous insight into human, the, the goodness, the fundamental goodness and of people and particularly those men who were so brutally tortured by the United States at Guantanamo. Thank you, thank you for bringing that to the fore, the fundamental goodness of people. I, you know, I think we have to be reminded of that. Um, when I interviewed uh, Muhammadu al-Salahi, it was remarkable to me that he still had hope and aspirations and, and he was inspired by so many people to go ahead and live a, a full, fulfilling life. And he really, truly wanted to connect with people who had tortured him, not to punish them. I think really out of curiosity as to, you know, why, why, why would you do this? Yeah. So I, I agree with you. One of the telling features of, uh, or one of the indicators of the basic goodness of people is how the people who were in the military were reacting to following out orders. It was yeah. really destroying them. They did not want to do this. Right. And, and I think I would say in the report I wrote, so I wrote a report for the United Nations on my mm -hmm. visit. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming uh, to this press conference by the Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms While Countering Terrorism, Ms. Finula Niolen, following the conclusion of her technical visit to the United States and the detention facility at the U.S. Naval Station Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Uh, the special rapporteurs, as you know, are independent experts who are appointed by the Human Rights Council. They are part of what is known as the Council's Special Procedures, which is the largest body of independent experts in the UN, UN human rights system. Uh, Ms. Finula will deliver opening remarks, and then she will take your questions. You have the floor. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, a special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms while countering terrorism, I welcome the completion of my technical visit to the United States and to the detention facility at the U.S. naval base at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. This visit marks the first the General Assembly visit of the United Nations last year, and I think one of the things that that report it, it it does two things. Clearly, the focus in the context of Guantanamo is the ongoing conditions of torture of cr torture, cruel, and human and degrading treatment under international law. And my concern that the the standard of cruel and human and degrading treatment is generally met for the ongoing conditions that these men, these remaining now thirty men, endure. Um, but also that for individuals, the standard of torture may be met because of the particularities of the harms that they are experiencing. But I think the lessons we take away also include that these harms, for example, also had like harms for the young men and women who were posted there. The in when you are for when you obey orders that are manifestly in some ways illegal under international law, when you may be committed in acts that my mandate has called crimes against humanity and other UN experts have said that the acts committed by the CIA in this torture rendition po program may meet that standard, it does something to you. Like people, the people who inflict these harms, those surround these harms, those who order these harms, like inhumanity, to others breeds inhumanity in our inside ourselves. And I think that's really important. But also to remind ourselves that the fact of torture means that the victims of 9-11 are never going to get, in my view, unlikely to get a trial because torture evacuates the possibility of fair trial, meaning that the folks who thought that they would at the end of this process of rendition, the families, the mothers, the children of those who were killed on 9-11 are also, I think, the victims of the torture uh, and rendition program because they will never get their day in court. And, 
And above all else, of course, the men, many of whom are now resettled or um, or who have gone home, continue to live with the, the harm of torture. And I mean, one of, the, I think, the most profound findings in my own report is that there's been no torture rehabilitation for any of these men. Not a single individual has had torture rehabilitation. Not a single individual has been compensated. Not a single individual has had accountability for that torture. And, you know, this is where the huge gaps are. And we, we see many of these men who've left struggling with the long-term mental and physical health um, harms that follow from torture um, and also living with very little support, which is why things like the Guantanamo Survivors Fund, which is the sort of a fund that supports these men in the absence of any kind of compensation by the US government is critical because otherwise quite literally many of these men would be in absolute penury in the countries they've gone back to. This, this is wonderful that you're sitting here and explaining this to us, you know, and looking at your resume, it's quite extensive. Um, and I, I just marvel at the amount of time and effort that you've dedicated into investigating the ways in which um, humankind mistreats each other. And I'm wondering, you know, after you wrote this report and you delivered it to the, um, the General Assembly, what happens with that information? You know, is it all for naught? Is, is there something that is done with your report that will result in us having a positive impact? Well, I think this is one of the challenges, you know, anybody who's in, listening who does human rights work know that actually most of what we do, actually a lot of the time is we witness. We witness, we record, we document. And sometimes the effects of our efforts are not seen in the short term. So my report um, gives a series of recommendations to the United States government. And those recommendations, some of them are short term, I would call them low hanging fruit, things like simple things that say, don't shackle these men all the time, and um, make sure that they have torture rehabilitation in the prison right now, those who remain detained, make sure that there are independent medical experts who have access to these men because they don't trust their doctors who are in the chain of military command. These things are, these things are they're, they're, they're not impossible. These are things that are, in a sense, deliverable within the framework of the current uh, uh, operation of Guantanamo. But I think it's been really regrettable. The US hasn't implemented any of the recommendations. And I mean, on the one hand, I think it's really important that the visit I did happened because there's no prison in the world that the UN shouldn't be able to access because the idea that there are these dark, closed places where harm happens, especially for democracies, is just inconsistent with the idea of democracy or the rule of law. So the visit is a necessary but not sufficient condition of the US's compliance here. And the, the test is whether or not the recommendations are implemented and they haven't been. And I think that means that the UN and I, my successor is closely watching. He just issued a press release yesterday on another detainee who has been transferred back to Algeria and was tortured, um, Said Boucher, who was tortured and uh, disappeared and is now being charged, even though he spent 20 years with no charges in an American prison, he's now being charged for offenses um, that we believe there is no adequate evidence for. And so the scrutiny of the US goes on. And so I think the problem for the US is you cannot have a global moral authority on human rights as long as Guantanamo Bay remains open. You cannot be a global moral voice and telling other countries what to do when the stain of torture continues to permeate your legal system through your military commissions that and um, do not, in my view, in the UN's view, allow for fair trials. So the US, like uh, fundamentally, Guantanamo is like an albatross for the US. And until you fix it, it's like the pottery barn rule, it's broken. And you're responsible for the breaking and you're responsible for the fixing. 
Wow. Yes, you're absolutely right. Now, the work that you've done, was it limited to um, Guantanamo? No, it, it wasn't. My mandate was a global mandate. So Guantanamo has in some sense been this incredibly high profile part of the work, probably because of the site visit to the facility. But we worked on numerous countries. I worked on Xinjiang and the issues of detention and, and so-called re-education camps in China. We worked on issues of um, in, in Sri Lanka and the use of the Prevention of Terrorism Act against uh, civil society actors. I worked on issues related to Syria and Iraq, and in particular, the detention of hundreds uh, and thousands of men, women, and children who've been deemed associated with the Islamic State in prisons in Northeast Syria. So I worked on every continent. My travels last year were from Mali to Northeast Syria to um, Southeast Asia to Latin America. We traversed, my team and I traversed the globe. So it is a truly global mandate. Wow, wow. Did you um, visit any prisons in domestically inside of the United States? So no, so the, the visit, you know, in the UN and in this role as a special rapporteur, you negotiate a visit in advance. And I was very clear that my role and my desire was to visit this one pres prison. And so that was the agreement. There are other UN special rapporteurs um, who have who have visited the United States um, and who've been able to um, access other prisons, but that wasn't part of this particular visit. Yeah. Right. Well, this has just been wonderful um, chatting with you and educating the LA progressive community about the wonderful work you've been doing. I mean, we just barely touched, uh, touched the tip of the iceberg, but um, I would love to pick up on this conversation at another time. I try to keep these videos uh, less than 20 minutes. I'm generally not successful, but, but I try to because our analytics show us that people will only listen to about 10 minutes and then yeah, they cut it off. I know so, it. It's, <laughs> so it's sort of not worth investing too much yeah. time. But if we do you know, several small ones, we can actually get more of this kind of information to the public because we rarely find out about this stuff. Right. No, I mean, I, I'm really grateful for the connection. And I think the, the really important thing about your progressive community is the idea that we connect the global and the local, that these things that seem far away are really important to what's happening domestically. And that, you know, that our, our borders and our minds are big, right, that we have the capacity to hold many of the global challenges in our hearts, but also understand our own power. And I would say that to your listeners, that there's an enormous power in people's advocacy on issues like Guantanamo, on people's support to this film. Go see the film, go understand what happened there better. And if you feel minded, you know, support the Guantanamo Survivors Fund so that these men have the capacity to rebuild their lives in the absence of US. Yes. That's right. And, and I'm going to provide a link to that. And I noticed that you're also affiliated with another website, Just Security. I saw that on your Twitter. I am account. one of the editors of Just, I'm one of the founding editors of Just Security. <laughs> so we encourage people to read that as well. Yes. Well, Fanula Ni Aloin, so nice having this chat with you. And I look forward to catching up with you again. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So long. So long. Bye-bye. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.